welcome to today's episode of Life Expressions. I'm your host, Chari Hineti Elon. And today we have a very special conversation lined up for you. We'll be talking about living young, dying old. Our guest is someone who embodies this philosophy through his vibrant life, dynamic career, and relentless pursuit of passion and purpose well into his later years. Join us as we explore the secrets to maintaining a youthful spirit, the importance of lifelong learning, and how to live fully at any age. And so, before I continue, I would like to invite you, if you're not yet subscribed, please hit that subscribe button of Life Expressions. My guest is no less than John A. Brink. John was born in 1940 in Nazi-occupied Holland and endured the harsh conditions of World War II. Liberated by Canadian soldiers in 1945, John dreamed of moving to Canada. After serving in the Dutch Air Force, he emigrated to Prince George in 1965 with just $25.45 and the goal of building a lumber mill. Ten years later, he founded Brink Forest Products, now North America's leading manufacturer of value-added wood products. At 83, John Brink is the president and CEO of the Brink Group of Companies and Other Businesses. 10 plus other businesses. He hosts the On the Brink podcast, which has more than 1.5 million subscribers in his multi multiple platforms, has authored four books and advocates for ADHD awareness. In recognition of his achievements, he received an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Northern British Columbia, the Order of British Columbia, and the Lumber Man of the Year Award. John donated $1 million to the College of New Caledonia to support the Trades and Technology Center. Today, John is proud to have his name showcased on the John A. Brink Trades and Technology Center at the College of Northern British Columbia. In his spare time, he enjoys dressage or dressage, bodybuilding, philanthropy, writing, public speaking, and spending time with his family. Wow. It is my honor and pleasure to have on the podcast no less than the John A. Brink. Welcome to Life Expressions, John. Hey, Sherry. Thank you for that <laughs> introduction. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. It is my honor and pleasure. And thank you so much for sending me this book, Living Young. Dying Old. This is your fourth book already. Congratulations. Yeah, the fourth, and I'm working on my fifth and sixth book, actually. Uh, the fifth one should come out next July or August 2025, and the, the other one uh, about the forest industry, actually, uh, somewhere in April of 2025. Oh, that's amazing. You are unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> John, what inspired you to write Living Young and Dying Old? Very interesting question, uh, Sherry, is that I have I was a late bloomer in a way, uh, you know, that everybody needs a shock in life that makes them look at themselves and saying, what am I doing? Am I going in the right direction? And I was one of those individuals that at every year and we say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, 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 and the other thing, and I'm going to buy a membership to the gym. And then within two weeks, we find a hundred reasons why we are just too busy to go to the gym. And then I had a shock that nearly killed me. I had a case of diverticulitis, which uh, means in my particular case, a breach uh, uh, in my colon that spilled all the toxins through my body and you need to be fairly quickly and uh, uh, attend to it and if you don't then it can well kill you and so uh, it took me nearly too long to get to uh, uh, Prince George and then to the hospital and then by the time I was done the operation the doc said to me you came this close and so it gave me a shock and it started looking at health and fitness. Now, my wife is a vegetarian and, uh, and I was not always a good listener, but I was not overly abusive, but not as good as I could be. So the other thing that I did is I bought a membership in the gym. I hired a trainer. This was in 2009. And I started to really go to the gym in earnest. And after doing that for about six years intensely, most of the things that I do, I give it all that I got. 
uh, somebody came up to us and said, hey, John, have you ever thought about competing? Yeah. And I said, me? Really? And and so then I thought, yeah, that maybe is a goal that I need and, and take things serious. And so then in 2017, 2018, I competed bodybuilding and already then in my late 60s, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, started looking at competing in Northern British Columbia, I came in second and third in bodybuilding and physique. That qualified me for the provincials, came in third and second, and that qualified me for the nationals and the Arnolds. And then COVID came. And so uh, so then that slowed me down a bit. I still went to the gym, but not quite as frequently as I used to. And then now again, I'm training again for the Arnolds. And the picture that you refer to is this yeah. one here. Uh, that's me. And again, I'm training to go to the Arnolds in 2025. And, uh, you know, so the other thing that I did as a result of the operation and being so close to uh, not making it is I started listening to my wife better in terms of diet. And yeah. I became what I call 80-20, uh, uh, a vegan. Uh, uh, and so... And that's what I kind of have followed and probably I'm more like a 90, 10 now, I would say. So my diet is substantially plant-based. I'm very coincident and I'm very cautious about the food that I eat and diet. And I still go to the gym and, uh, and obviously it changed my life because what happens with the gym is that you? See, it takes time to see the results. And as you see the results, you start feeling better. And combine that with a good and healthy diet, then even at, in my case, 83 and starting late, really, uh, you know, so in 2008, I was about 68 years old. And I changed everything uh, that I do. And you saw the picture of yeah. me in the book between my diet. So... I'm very fit. I'm very healthy. I love going to the gym and, uh, and I, I plan to live uh, until I'm 120. Wow. And you're sharing the things that you're doing, living young and maximizing the time that you have. How many are 83 year olds joining the Arnolds? I bet it's just you. <laughs> Not many. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I'm doing the Arnold's, uh, I'm in my 85th year. Wow. So, but, but that's not going to slow me down. And, uh, but I love it. But hence, the inspiration is that I'm simply saying, especially with all the controversy politically and otherwise about age and saying, if you're 80, you're too old, and this year too old, and all the other things. Age is just a number. It's quality of life that counts, really. And uh, in my case, is that uh, I love what I'm doing. And uh, even now, still, uh, I'm very busy working. Uh, you know, uh, I go usually to, I get up at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, I always make my bed and I always think I'm late. And, and so with all the different companies that I have, and I'm not here to brag about my companies, but I'm very, very active be active in podcasting, going to the gym, writing books or being an author, uh, public speaking to me is stuff that I like to do. And uh, I enjoy life. And and so uh, so the quality is uh, to me is that when I came to Canada, as you already said, during the introduction is then I came off the bus. I had the dream yeah. of coming to Canada, the land of my heroes that liberated us in 1945 and uh, and then th then addition to that is my grandfather was a master carpenter my dad works in the lumber industry my dream was to build my own lumber mill yeah. and then the other challenge that i had is uh, academically i was not a success story i failed grade three and i failed grade seven three times so he said what are we going to do with this guy and some people said to my parents, well, send him to the mentally challenged school. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We'll, we'll teach him a trade. So at 13, I want to work for a furniture factory. And I loved it. And I became a furniture maker. But I still had the dream of going to the land of my heroes, Canada. 
and then build myself a lumber mill in Western Canada and in particular British Columbia. And so when I came off the bus uh, in Prince George, after somebody in Vancouver at the immigration uh, department, I, uh, I could not speak English, didn't know a soul, didn't know anybody, didn't have a job. But fortunately, there was a German fellow working there. I could speak some German. And then I told him what I wanted to do. He said, go to Prince George. That's where they're building lumber mills and it's, it's a boom town. And so I did that 12, 13 hours in the bus. And then I came off the bus here 60 years ago. I had my suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes, and I counted my money at least three times. I had exactly $25 and 47 cents. And, but I had a dream. And, and then the other part that was a benefit to me, attitude. Attitude to me is I will always, even through the toughest time, I'm always an optimist. Tomorrow will be better if today is difficult. And I always believe that. The second one is passion. Whatever I do, I give it 125%. And then work ethic, even now, as I said earlier, I work harder than anybody, even at nearly 84. And so uh, that's what I do. And, uh, and obviously, soon after I came here, within uh, studying as a cleaner man, dental lumber pilot, fairly quickly, I became a superintendent of a mill. And as you already indicated in the introduction, I then started uh, my own lumber companies and then a number of other companies. And, uh, and then I'm writing books and do all these other stuff. And then at 83, people say to me, how, how do you do all this stuff? Yeah. How do you do all those? ADHD, that's why, and that's how. And so it was very late in life that, uh, by pure coincidence, I picked up a book in a, in a bookstore here, and the book's title was Driven to Distraction, which was a book written by Dr. Halliwell about ADHD. And I still don't know why I picked up the book. I opened the book and started looking at it. And I said, oh, my God, that's me. So I wrote in the book in Dutch. Now I finally know who I am. And, and the reason that I did, because there was an, a stigma attached to it and the suggestion that it's a mental uh, disorder of some description, which it obviously isn't. But then it was looked at uh, with some uh, challenges. Uh, and, and so for me, building companies, so what am I going to do? Go to the bank and make my business presentation to them and uh, for uh, lending me hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to build different factories. And uh, then I would have to say, oh, by the way, I, I have a mental disorder called ADHD. And they would say, have a nice day. So obviously not now, but then. And uh, so you know, that's kind of what it is. And then the more I found out about ADHD and the more I found out that frequency of occurrence much higher than initially thought, it was initially thought to be around 8%. I thought it was more like 20% or maybe even higher. And, and so you are podcast. Oh, you know, no, you're not my podcast, but on my podcast on the blank, yeah. my podcast, number 203 is an interview that I did with Dr. Halliwell, probably yeah. one of the best known individuals that has written about ADHD globally, highly respected. He was on my podcast and he's written about 18 books and uh, five of them on distraction. He is ADHD and dyslective. Uh, so am I, and uh, but immensely successful. So when I had my discussion with him about ADHD, I suggested that he's the expert, not me, that I thought uh, it is probably ADHD, probably closer to 20%. He said to me, no, John, more than 25%. I agree with him. He said the other part is what's interesting. I suggested from my experience that I believe among entrepreneurs, and CEOs, it, it, my experience has been that I believe probably 50% of them are ADHD. He said, no, John, probably 75% of successful ones in particular. And I agree with him. So I look at ADHD as a superpower. 
Yeah. And then I felt I had to, you know, it took me 50 years to find out and get the diagnosis because I left the school as a failure and 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 looked at it as being dumb and stupid and all the other kinds of things. And then my friends no longer were really my friends because kids are hard on each other. And so I became, they went on to college, university, and I became a laborer. And it was kind of looked down on. I'm proud of that today, but then it was kind of looked down on. And so then considering that I was 62 when I was really diagnosed by, uh, you know, my doc who delivered our two daughters and was a personal friend. And he said to me, hey, John, why are you here? He said, I said, I think I got ADHD. And so we looked at it, checked it all out. Yeah, I do. So yeah. what is important for me in a lot of cases to share my story with others and then to write a book about it. I did that. Yes. ADHD the unlocked quite successful actually and it's not only necessarily with people that have adhd but also with people that because of trauma are slow learners and then the other part because of the frequency of occurrence in my mind is much broader than as dr Halliwell pretty much confirms saying that 25 percent and CEOs, probably 75%, that I believe that it is probably close to somewhere between 25 and 30%. So for all the people that will encounter either ADHD in their circle family or a friends or in their businesses will encounter it. And for them to buy the book and get to know a little bit more about ADHD will kind of make and uh, enlighten to them who these people are with ADHD because they tend to be a little bit different in a positive way than most people are. And you much, yeah. yeah. And then, but it's a superpower in my mind, or it can be. And why is that a superpower, John? And why it can be a superpower if you choose to? So if I look back at myself, even when I went to school, I was a very good writer, not a good reader because of ADHD and dyslexia. And then I was very good in numbers, but attention to me was something that was a challenge because I may not have, uh, I, you know, I, I became bored very, very quickly. And so uh, that became a challenge for me. And then as I understood it better, that's why it took me so long. When I picked up the book from Dr. Halliwell in 1997, January 1997 is when I picked up the book from Dr. Halliwell, uh, you know, and I was then 57 years old. Yeah. And then after I read it, uh, as I said earlier, it took me five years before I went to my doc. And the more I thought about it, the more I read it, uh, it, it allowed me to reconcile with me as to why was I who I was. I never quite knew who I was and to find peace of mind and know that you're just as good as all the others, but simply the traditional learning model doesn't work for some people. And ADHD is a classic example. Yeah. But after then, after f being there for, I was 57, five years later, my doc, we confirmed it. I was diagnosed. And from there on in, as it became more part, I then accelerated in doing other things that I love to do. I started writing a book. The first book that I wrote is Against All Odds. Yes, I read it, that too. It took me 80 years to live it, 20 years to think about it, two years to write it. And it's not about hey, hurrah, hurrah, uh, as you know, how successful John is. It's all, all the ups and downs. Yes. And so if I look back now, is that how, you know, there I came from Holland, extreme northeastern part of Holland, where we spoke dialect. And a lot of times dialect already was kind of looked down on that. It was not high Dutch. And so, but I loved speaking dialect, even still today I do. But when I came in schooling, 
I only went up to grade seven, so it was no problem for me to speak dialect. But when I went to the army, I had to acquire to speak high Dutch, which took me a bit. And then, uh, so I had to acquire speaking high Dutch. The next thing I went to Canada, I could speak a language, I had to learn to speak English. And uh, so, and then to become from that background, I was always very interested in a lot of things that were happening. If I heard about a successful speaker, and somewhere in Holland, I would go out of my way to listen to the person and to, in my mind, I want to figure out what made them click, what made them senior in areas than others. And I've always done. And, the, and then if you probably is on your mind and saying, what were the three books that you took with you uh, from Holland? Yes. The one was Management by Drucker, a uh, very popular book in North America but in Dutch, I took that with me and, and already uh, read that several, several times. It's always been part of my still have it. And then the other one was also in Dutch, logical thinking, uh, very important to me and all the things that I do even still today. And then the other part is uh, about Canada. And, and so the whole combination of all of that skill sets that it took me a long time to acquire them, but it made me excel in them. The other part, uh, uh, Sherry, that was important is that I was not a good communicator. I was very self-confident in terms of uh, interacting with people outside of my little circle around my companies. How did you become the great communicator that you are today? Yeah, that's interesting that you say that. Yeah, it happened coincidental. And and so that an ex-sister-in-law that I had in 1990 dragged me to an organization called Toastmasters. And Toastmasters, uh, for the, our friends watching, just look it up on uh, globally and uh, on the internet. And it's an organization that has been around for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, probably four, 450,000 people as we are speaking are part of Toastmaster clubs all around North America and in other places. Probably here in Prince George, uh, there are probably three in, in uh, Vancouver, there are probably 20, 30 Toastmaster clubs. And it's, it's where you acquire the skills to become a communicator. So when she took me down there, I said, okay, what is it all about? She said, they, they, it's about communication skills. And I said, are they, are they gonna ask me any questions? He said, no, you just said that you watch it. And if you like it, you go back. I said, okay, I'll go down there. Halfway through the meeting, they said, hey, John, tell us all about it. I said, oh my God, I'll never go back here. But I did. I stayed there for 10 years and then became a distinguished Toastmaster. Enough, probably 10 million people that became Toastmasters in different levels all around the world less than 1% of them goes to the level of distinguished those messes. So for me, that part changed my life. Yeah. And so, uh, so I'm a late bloomer. So it gave me confidence, which is so critically important. It allowed me to express myself in writing, which I love to do. And then the other part, uh, becoming an, uh, in demand keynote speaker, but more so now is that with keynote speaking, if if I go to certain venues, it usually takes me two days to get there. And, and so I still do that selectively, but I became very active in podcasting. And, and so if you and me are sitting here, uh, you know, we have podcasts all around the world globally, and, and it is still very much in its infancy, in my opinion. And as we are having a discussion, uh, you will post it on your websites that you use, and I will post it on mine when you make it available to me. We then already know that tens of thousands of people will watch us in this conversation. That is true. Yeah. John, you have mentioned, it's it's great that you have mentioned Toastmasters. And I'm proud to say that I'm also a member of Toastmasters, Telecom Toastmasters Club. And yes, being a distinguished Toastmasters is not an easy feat. And 
you are right, only 1% or less of Toastmasters become distinguished Toastmaster. And so kudos to you. And you are actually inspiring a lot of people doing this podcast. You have mentioned earlier about your practices, your eating habits, your active lifestyle, going to the gym. What are the other new insights and perspectives can you offer or you're offering in your book, Living Young, Dying Old? Because I've read it and it is so interesting. You have lots of new perspectives that have to be shared with the audience. Yeah, so what I want to make sure of, uh, Sherry, is that the approach that I took, I'm not a doctor and I don't give medical advice. And so there are lots of books out there from other people. So I simply wanted to take the approach is saying, this worked for me. And here is a picture of me. And, and so this is what I did, is that diet, food, critically important. Sleep, one of the other areas, very, very critical, uh, you know, and, and, and from a health perspective. And then exercise, obviously. And then the other part is on the mental side, which is so important from who you are is staying positive, attitude, uh, passion, work ethic to me are critical. And uh, so I, uh, I'm a positive individual. I, I avoid negative. Yeah. And, uh, and so, and then the other part is that uh, once I do something, I'm very committed to staying the course. And, and uh, you know, and so, and then I make sure medically that I understand, uh, you know, the, the medical, uh, you know, the, 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 the requirements of how do I stay fit and healthy? I don't like chemicals. And, and so how can we do it naturally? And how do we go about that? Yes. And then the other part that I do is that I'm very conscientious of, at least on an annual basis, I do what I call a bumper to bumper uh, of, of my body. And then I'm very conscientious of understanding uh, the uh, supplements, including hormones and other things that help and make me understand to not baiting until I got a disease, but being ahead of it. Yeah. You are unstoppable. You are still very energetic. You defy the norm, shall I say. You always go the extra mile. But what were the major challenges that you have encountered recently that allowed you to say, hey, I can still do it no matter what? I always stay positive. And, and so that is not to say that I don't have challenges. Uh, you know, like uh, other people have. It's just a question how to deal with it. Uh, like going to the gym. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been doing that since uh, 2009 with the interruption uh, for COVID uh, when the places were closed. But uh, I've always made that part of my life. And, and what I say to people is that you don't have to become an Olympian. You don't have to become a bodybuilder or anything like that at least at least go out walk for a half an hour two days a week three days a week gradually make that part of your life and what you will see as you do that continuously then you will see improvements diet very very important uh, my wife is vegetarian but i do pretty much all of the shopping and she's very particular uh, uh, for her in the grocery store and uh and so if I go into a grocery store, I stay on the outside in the grocery store and, and I'm very uh, conscientious of uh, organic uh, plant food in particular that I know what is in it, but is on it. Prepared yeah. food, uh, you know, I, uh, in the center house, I don't know what's in it, so we don't use that. Yeah. How often do you go to the gym, John? How often I go to the gym? If uh, Right now I go three times a week. Wow. And then, and then uh, how long but, each time? Yeah, and and then if I get ready for uh, going competing, like by next spring, uh, I will start or uh, later this fall. So we'll get ready for competing in twenty twenty five. 
then I build it up to going about five times a week. Yeah. John, you have written four books and you're on to your fifth and sixth in 2025. Your podcast is growing tremendously well. What is the key message that you would want to impart to your audience? Attitude, passion, work ethic, and never give up. And then what I do a lot of times, uh, uh, Sherry, as you know, I travel around a lot and uh, in business, uh, we do a lot of business in the United States. And But even here, I travel a lot along, uh, around in airplanes. And when I sit by the, I usually when I'm in a commercial, I'm also a pilot, but if I sit in a commercial plane, a lot of times, I sit by the window and I look outside and I say, it's paradise. It is paradise. We the luckiest people in the world. And I'm not sure always that we fully appreciate that, but I grew up in a dictatorship, uh, you know, with Adolf Hitler, uh, you know, the control over our country that affected our lives and, and changed my mom and dad's lives. But, and a lot of people think that war, you have war and after war is over, everything goes back to normal. It simply doesn't. And so what I say first and foremost, appreciate where we are. Yes. And and you can relate to that from the Philippines, uh, you know, the uh, beautiful, beautiful country, but things are difficult and challenging there as well. And, and if we are here, so we are very, very fortunate being here. The True. other part that I would say to people is that giving back to the community always has been important to me, even at a time that... Uh, I didn't have much money. I would always try to be involved in the community. I believe that's very important and it's part of my background. And then every day, not based on religion, but every day I appreciate how fortunate I am and my family is of being here in uh, North America and in particular in Canada. Yeah, I think what sets you really apart, John, is your positivity your passion, your work ethic, and your being a philanthropy. And we appreciate you doing what you do. I appreciate that, uh, Shari. Yes. Finally, John, what is your message to your fans like me who, would, who, who are aspiring to live young, die old, and continue to be a positive impact in the community? Well, you're doing a lot of that already because I have always been inspired by you uh, and I know you from your relationship with my dear friend, Peter Lake, uh, you know, and also an amazing writer. And I should quickly mention your books. You're also an author yeah. and you wrote a couple of books. And uh, one was Mornings with uh, Peter. Uh, wow, this, thank you. Know, you. And then the other one that... Uh, I, uh, wisdom bites uh, another one that is just finished, I believe. Not awesome. Long yeah, thank you. So, and and then uh, our mutual friend, Peter, I think he wrote something like 27 books or 28. Yes. <laughs> also an amazing individual. So probably it's a mindset for me, you know, that every day, is a good day. It doesn't mean some days that I say, mm, you know, I'm not as excited as I may have been yesterday, but that's for me seldom. And, and uh, you know, and then, but then happens if you have a positive mindset, then things will happen. And a lot of people say to me that, oh my God, that John Branke, he, he has a lot of business. He must be this, that, and he's so lucky and blah, blah. So it's, but I say is the harder you work, the luckier you get. So that's how it works. And then always, it's not money that drives me, but it's the satisfaction of being able to share things, uh, you know, with the community. That's why I wrote uh, Against All Odds. That's why I wrote uh, ADHD. That's why I wrote this one. And then the other one that I wrote is an interesting book in a way is that what I found a lot of times with young people in particular, I heard this on the U.S. News actually the other day, forget about which channel, and they said that 75% of the people that work, I believe it's the same in Canada, didn't like their jobs. Hmm. 
and 70 percent of the 75 percent are looking at an other job so a lot of times when i do presentations for young people i ask them a lot of times so you're going to high school college or university and say where do you go from here and say well i don't know you know so i say it's important that you respectfully that that you kind of check it out you want to be a truck driver hypothetically speaking talk to somebody that drives truck see what is the benefit what is this that and or you want to be a builder contractor talk to a contractor or you want to be an investor talk to an investor or you want to be a lawyer talk to lawyers so the a lot of them would love to talk to people that are interested in what they are doing or an entrepreneur or whatever and, and so it gives you a direction to choose from so i felt i had to write a book about it so i said finding your passion living the dream yeah and and then after working uh, i started working when i was 13 so now I'm 83, going 84. After working for 70 years, are you still living the dream, John? I sure am. Awesome. And, and it's attitude substantially yeah. And, yeah. and and always have, trying to be positive. You have actually found your passion and you are living the dream. John, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your inspiration. Thanks, Sherry, to be on your podcast. Let's stay in touch and... Uh, uh, good luck, and uh, I lo I love your books. I uh, Thank you. you know so, uh, and I will read them. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And to all of you who have stayed with us, thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation with John Brink. And if you have comments, please feel free to put them on the chat or on YouTube. A comment, and don't forget to subscribe to Life Expressions. I'm your host, Chari Hineta Elon, and with me is John Brink. Thank you so much. Till next time, here on Life Expressions.